Okay, here we go. The Federal Reserve is wrapping up a meeting today, and there are expectations of a rate cut. We'll talk about the what then with President Trump preparing his move back into the White House. And we'll talk about energies and financial aid and the farm bill. We've got it all on the agenda. Live, we are over the hump via Farm Journal broadcast, and this is Agritalk. This morning, we begin with a conversation with Bob Elliott from Unlimited Fund. Then it's John Newton and Matt Clark from Terrain. Later, Jordan Fife from BioUrgia. And directly following the news, Neville Spear from Drovers. I'm the handsome newsman, Davis Michelson. Now, say hello to your beloved host, Chip Borey. All right, Davis. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. I'm just going <laughs> to ease minute. into this. I'm just going to ease Did your attention wane this. there for a second? No. I feel like... I, no. Uh, okay. Okay. I caught everything. I've just decided that I'm going to stay calm here at the start of the show because we have got a lot of ground that we want to cover. We've got a lot of issues that we want to get to. This is yeah. a jam-packed, okay, now what kind of show. And I got, uh, so I, I think it's okay. I think it's best if I just stay calm. Okay. Well, here, let's let's help you. This just in okay. from NBC yeah. News. Police hunt 40 monkeys that escaped from a South Carolina research facility. Uh, authorities advise anyone who finds a monkey should not interact with it, but instead call 911. This according oh to local God. authorities. What was, what was the name just, of the movie with Dustin Hoffman? Oh Outbreak. No. Did Outbreak Great. just happen? Oh, no. Don't say that. We were going to stay calm, Chip. We were going to oh stay my. calm. Yeah, but now I want to go. Where is it? No, no I want to go to South Carolina and help. Wasn't there a movie with Brad Pitt called 12 Monkeys? Oh, was it 12 yeah. Monkeys? Yep. This yep. is like the sequel. Yeah, but this okay. is like at least three monkeys. times as worse because this mm-hmm. is 40. Well, yeah. inflation. You know, <laughs> inflation. inflation. 12 Monkeys, you know, used to get you with 40 ground. Monkeys. Yeah, 40 yeah. Monkeys would get you that today. Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm glad that we've got that out of the way. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, 40 see? monkeys have escaped mm-hmm. from a research facility, South Carolina. Hmm. Yeah, we're here I'll to inform. About, That's what we I'll do. I'll be darned. You know what? I think I'd rather talk mm. about the weather. What do you got? Well, the National Weather Service expects heavy snow to impact portions of Colorado and New Mexico, while heavy rain, severe weather, as well as increasingly windy conditions will sweep across the southern plains through the next few days. A heavy rain threat over the southeast is expected to gradually diminish by this evening. Hurricane Rafael forecast to track more westwardly away from the Florida Keys and into the Gulf of Mexico through the next couple days. Record warmth continues in the mid-Atlantic down into the southeast and along the Gulf Coast. They're announcing that uh, the hurricane is forecast to track into the Gulf of Mexico and away from the Florida Keys. That's great news for the Florida Keys, but where's it going to go? Well, and it's weakening. And and okay. I the the last forecast that I looked at, uh, you know what I don't even remember who it was from, was mm-hmm. that it is going to weaken to a tropical storm and have about forty mile an hour winds by the time it makes landfall, Mexico, southern Texas. All right. Well, Chip, USDA reported daily sales of one hundred twenty thousand metric tons of corn for delivery to unknown destinations during the twenty four twenty five marketing year. Yeah, that corn Big demand games. just keeps rolling yep. along. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Yep. Uh, big gains scored in all three major U.S. stock indices in the wake of former President Donald Trump prevailing in the Tuesday elections. And all three struck new record finishes with the blue chip index registering its largest post-election gain. Get this, since 1896, Chip. Man, oh man, NASDAQ is sharply higher again this morning. The Dow is just slightly lower in the S&P up, what is that, 31 points, 32 points? Yep. Yep. So in consolidating in the S&P and the Dow, but boy, the NASDAQ is off and running again. Yep. Well, the GOP made significant gains in the Senate. Republicans won at least 53 states exceeding expectations. In the House, Republicans maintained narrow control with about 15 races still uncertain, particularly in California and Arizona. Yeah. Narrow enough that I don't know if I want to call that. Uh, yeah, you, no. you know, with in, in the House. So and on the on the Senate side, what does it mean for the farm bill? We'll talk to John Newton about that this morning. 
Well, President-elect Trump secured 63% of the rural vote, surpassing his 2016 performance, and is set to work with farm groups and Congress on overdue agricultural policies. Key issues include, of course, passing a new farm bill, mm-hmm. mitigating high costs, averting tax hikes, and addressing labor shortages. All on the priority list and, and should be. Yep. And a couple of quick hits here on other election items. Voters rejected ballot measure 309, which aimed to ban slaughterhouses in the city and county of Denver, Colorado. And this one, by a nearly 6-to-1 margin, voters in California's Sonoma County defeated an effort to limit the size of livestock farms and phase out operations that exceeded those limits. Yeah, and in South Dakota, they made it tougher for some at Carbon Solutions Pipeline, is Oof. is how I understand it. I still need to look a little deeper and figure out exactly what some of its plans might be after this. Yep. Well, the Fed is expected to cut interest rates 25 basis points following the conclusion of its two-day monetary policy meeting at 1 p.m. Central Time. But the path of future rate cuts is uncertain after Donald Trump's return to the presidency. And finally, Chip Beyond Meat lowered its annual revenue forecast. The company attributed the cut to reduced consumer spending on more expensive plant-based products as shoppers opt for cheaper alternatives. Quarterly sales volumes dropped by 7.1% compared to a 3.5% increase in the same period last year. Chip. Cheaper alternatives. Right. Opt for cheaper alternatives. What they're doing is opting for quality is what they're doing. Speaking of that, let's bring him in right now. Neville Spear, contributing editor there at Grover's. How you doing, Neville? I'm doing great, Chip. How are you? Okay, good, good, good. Help me understand what's happening in this beef market. It seems like we are experiencing a true increase in demand. Yeah, and I'm just going to say here, here, right? Quality, as you're talking about, beyond meat. And, uh, you know, Chip, you, you left me last week as we closed out and and you need to coin this or trademark it, right? You said quality creates comeback customers. It's a fantastic yeah. phrase, right? So I just decided when we got done, I'm gonna go look at the data. Through October, prime, it, we're running almost 11% prime, okay? That's up 10% or excuse me, it's up 7% versus 10 years ago. Premium choice, upper two thirds choice, we're running 33% for the year. That's up 8%. So, you know, combined, a premium product, we're up 15% versus 10 years ago. Select, we're running less than 13% through October. It's the first time ever we've fallen below 13, and we're down sharply where we were, right? We are very clearly moving the quality grade pendulum to the upper end. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Okay, so what does that mean for us going forward here, Neville? What... Well, it, well, it seems like you, really good news. Yeah, it's it's great news, right? And and you know we're not even to the best grading cattle yet. We've still got another month or so to go, but it's yeah. it's ultimately in that this whole conversation that we've had in the last couple of weeks about carcass weights, stronger markets. What's driving all of that? It's to your point as we closed out last week. Better quality. It drives consumer yeah. demand and it makes yeah. all the difference, right? Come yep. back customers. Yep. Come back customers. It. Quality tends to make it uh, recession-proof. Absolutely. And we're we're seeing that right now. Man, through this whole conversation, I've been thinking about, hey, I heard it a million years ago from Dr. Wayne Purcell, Virginia Tech, a true increase yes. in beef demand is selling more at a higher price. Not selling the same amount at a higher price, selling more at a higher price. We need you to got get it. there. You, That's all right. right. Thank you, Neville. Agritalk is brought to you by ESN. Don't risk your nitrogen investment. ESN is designed to beat the five ROI killers and provide season-long end to your crop. Learn how ESN works at smartnitrogen.com. Welcome back to Agritalk. I'm your host, Chip Flory. Glad that you are with us on this Thursday morning. It is a Fed day. And, uh, man, oh, man, I love getting this guy on around these kinds of occasions, around these headline events so that we can try to figure out exactly what it means, drill through the the BS at the top, and really figure out what it means. We've got Bob Elliott, Chief Investment Officer at Unlimited Fund, with us right now. Bob, it is good to talk to you again. How are you? Uh, great to hear from you, Chip. Happy to be here. Uh 
pretty uh, pretty lively couple of days here in the financial markets. <laughs> okay, so let's start right there. What did what did you make of the Trump trade yesterday? And start with the equities. Was it a was it a one day wonder, or is there more where that came from? Well, I think a lot of folks uh, in the financial markets are penciling out a pretty pro-growth agenda coming from the Trump administration yeah. uh, and in particular able to execute that effectively, given that they're very likely to control uh, both houses of Congress. And so I think we're just starting to uh, get people's heads around what the composition of that will be, uh, but the direction in terms of uh, that pro-growth agenda looks pretty clear. And so this might be, well, just the beginning of that starting to get priced into the markets. Yeah. Man, Bob, I'm telling you, uh, if, if Republicans do hold on to that, even the slightest of a majority in the House, which it looks like they're going to, Trump, as you just mentioned, he has made so many pro-growth promises, tax cut promises. His supporters are going to, if he's got the Senate and the House, his supporters are going to expect to see this move from theory to reality in a short period of time. Can he deliver? Well, I think a lot of the things that um, are probably most immediately uh, influential are on the regulatory side where okay. the executive actually has a lot of flexibility to be able to execute regulatory relief across a wide range of sectors. You know, there's a reason why if you look at either energy or the banking system, we saw relatively sharp rallies yesterday in those sectors. It's because you know, with the stroke of a pen, a lot of the regulatory challenges that both of those sectors face um, from the current administration can be, uh, you know, wiped away or reduced. And if uh, the banking system uh, can heat up in terms of its activity uh, or, you know, the energy, the broad energy sector, uh, you know, gets to work on increasing production, those are two areas that almost immediately can have an influence. Right. Okay. All right. Why did the dollar react so aggressively with the big rally yesterday? Most most of the dynamic in the dollar is related to U.S. interest rates, as well as a bit on U.S. growth. You know, if you look at the U.S. relative to the rest of the world, the U.S. has higher interest rates, stronger growth, stronger equity markets, better earnings growth. And so you put that all together, uh, a pro-growth agenda that we're likely to see only sh should only further add fuel to uh, those elements that are that have caused, you know, U.S. exceptionalism relative to the rest of the developed world. And so we're seeing that, you know, play out in, in the dollar crosses. Okay. You know, it, it, well, you know what? I want one more, one more market reaction before we generalize here a bit. Energy markets. Why didn't the energy markets react more aggressively? Well, I think it's, it's a bit of a challenge because um, for the energy markets, because while there are, uh, are positive growth elements of the um, uh, of uh, the administration's policies. There's also a pro production element of the policies as well, and those two things are somewhat offsetting uh, each other okay. when you think yep. about yep. the cost of the commodity. You know, it's different for the companies. The companies are in better shape, and that's why they rallied so aggressively. But the commodity itself, it's kind of kind of a neutral set of factors that are coming out. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I get it. I get it. And, you know, the other thing is on the on the inflationary front, uh, Trump has said we're going to we're going to work on grocery prices. We're going to work on the, the prices of goods and services by making it cheaper to produce them, by making it cheaper to transport them uh, with lower energy prices going forward. Does that scare the oil companies at, at all when they hear something like that? I mean, most oil companies are um, are essentially taking a vig on the production, meaning taking you yeah. know a margin on the production. They yeah. are uh, somewhat incentivized by higher prices, but it's not the primary driver of profitability. Right. Um, and so, I, I think as honestly, the regulatory relief on their ability to 
um, uh, on their on their uh, on their day to day activities is a lot bigger deal than even marginal moves in in oil prices. Okay, all right. Um, how does the market react if Elon Musk does find a spot in the administration and does make a promise to cut two trillion dollars? from spending bob that seems like such a, a a huge whack yeah i i think there th- that sort of falls into this category of things where campaign rhetoric might not uh be actual okay. reality when it comes to implemented policy the idea of cutting two trillion dollars out of the budget on an annual basis isn't implausible given the discretionary spending is only 1.7 trillion and half of that is military spending which isn't going to get cut and so i i think the general idea of uh, a move towards less waste less wasteful government sure i think you know that that i can believe that that will be uh an influence on the administration's uh, actions but you know it's probably off by an order of magnitude or two okay okay um give me 20 seconds on this does the tariff threat fit into that category too you know campaign rhetoric yeah i I think in many ways uh the tariffs are more likely to be a bargaining chip than you know a wholesale executed policy at the stroke of a pen and so uh we'll learn a lot over the course of the next couple of uh months and and beyond about exactly where they're going to implement those but i wouldn't assume that the okay. talked about you know 10 percent on all imports and 60 percent on china that day one that that's going to happen it could easily be the sort of thing that's threatened and not executed in order to extract okay. concessions okay excellent what does the fed do today bob well the fed's cutting and part of the story here is that the fed can't start making decisions based upon prospective administration policy until those policies happen. And so if they're just looking at the macroeconomic story, they believe inflation is beat. You can argue with that, but that's what they believe. And therefore, cuts are coming, regardless of the electoral outcome. And and given that it's going to take, you know, into next year before the new administration's policies really influence uh, the macro economy, we're kind of in this interesting point where we're going to get a pretty good Fed easing over the course of the next six months and then followed up by a pretty good fiscal support in the six to 12 months after that. Okay. Okay. So, Bob, since since uh, the Fed cut rates last, Treasury yields have gone up. Should we expect even higher interest rates after this Fed funds cut? Yeah, the the I think the rise in uh, interest rates that we've seen uh, in the last six weeks or so is really just reflective of the fact that the U.S. economy is pretty strong, uh, and that there were some concerns that we might have been slipping to recession, and that caused a lot of flow into bonds, and those concerns have been a bit alleviated in this last uh, you know with data releases that we've been seeing, and so you know I think we're we're um, that sort of repricing back to roughly where we've been over the last couple of years uh, is is sort of a normal repricing. It, we're probably not going to see uh, a significant move higher, particularly given the fact that the Fed is pretty clearly in, uh, it pretty clearly has an easing bias for the next six months. Okay, easing bias for the next six months. President-elect Trump has said more than once that he would like to have more influence over interest rates going forward. Good idea to you? Well, there's really a value in uh, in the credibility that exists with uh, independent uh, Fed, and, and there is, I guess what I'd say, is some risk that that credibility gets called into question if there's meaningful influence from the president. But um, again, this is sort of the campaign rhetoric might not uh, not yep. might not be the ultimate reality. And so I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate from those comments that President Trump is going to be at the Fed, you know, making the policy <laughs> decision anytime soon. Gotcha. Gotcha. Bob, thank you so much for the time, man. I appreciate it, and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Always great to catch up. Excellent. Bob Elliott, Chief Investment Officer, Unlimited Funds. We are talking to John Newton and Matt Clark from Terrain Ag next. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady joins us right now. Holy bean oil, Batman. What the heck's going on there? Yeah, uh, soy oil market, uh, like you mentioned, just charging higher, about 120 points higher in most of the contracts here at mid-morning, and, and that's having a positive influence on the soybean market. Uh, now, beans are, are well off their highs, but still trading a nickel higher and, and uh, being somewhat limited by uh, selling pressure in meal. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about yesterday about the Trump trade and, and all that, and we're yeah. seeing an unwinding of some of that today. So the dollar's under heavy pressure, pulling back uh, from those massive gains yesterday. The stock market's weaker and, and those types of things. But the grain markets, they, they pretty much ignored the Trump trade yesterday, and, and they're kind of doing the same today, I guess. Uh, just, you know, the outside noise isn't having a huge influence necessarily. Okay. All right, wheat's under pressure, corn's under a little bit of pressure here this morning, too. Anything in particular we need to know? No, you know, the, the weekly export sales were really strong again for corn at, at almost 2.8 million tons. Soybeans had uh, over 2 million tons of sales again. We had another daily corn sale. So the export demand base uh, remains strong for corn and soybeans. Gotcha. Okay, take us over to the livestock trade. Another round of gains in the cattle complex. Yeah, so last week we had the uh, the big losses, obviously, and, and we're still trying to rebound from those levels. And, and so uh, holding us back somewhat is the fact that the wholesale beef prices have pulled back and, and there's concerns that maybe the cash market will weaken. But I don't think that there's great concerns there and the futures are trading well below the cash market. So that's given us a little bit of price support. Hog futures, uh, big update yesterday after filling their gap from a, a week or so ago, uh, but they're under pressure this morning. Good stuff, Brian. Thank you so much. Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady on Markets Now. Opinions expressed on AgriTalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, AgriTalk is live every weekday. All right. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm your host, Chip Flory. Glad that you were with us on this Thursday morning. Man, oh, man, the dust is uh, still billowing around us after the Trump win for the White House and and the Senate uh, flipping to GOP control. Uh, We've got the Fed meeting today. We've got a lot of ground that we still need to cover and a lot of of things that we need to figure out. And here to help us do that, John Newton, head of... Executive Head of Terrain. John, welcome back to AgriTalk. How are you, man? I'm doing good, Chip, and I've, I've got my good friend Matt Clark from Terrain with me as well. Yeah, Matt is the Senior Rural Economy Analyst there at Terrain. Matt, welcome to AgriTalk. It's good to talk with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, Chip. Okay, stick tight there, Matt. I'm going to get right back to you because I know the number one question that a lot of people have got out there right now, John, is how does the flip of the Senate to GOP control impact the process on the farm bill? What are your thoughts? Well, I think all of my former colleagues for for Senator Bozeman are happy because the number one thing, Chip, they get is to upgrade their offices. They get to move uh, from the from the basement of the Russell Building up to the sixth floor of the Dirksen Building. So that's that's great for them. Uh, but the reality, Chip, is you know the the House and Senate have been unable to pass a farm bill uh, yet this year. You've seen uh, GT was able to get something out of committee, but but we haven't seen anything go over the floor. So, you know, they come back next week, they'll have their leadership votes on Tuesday. And and I think the conversation will shift to, uh, can we get a bipartisan farm bill over the finish line in the lame duck? Uh, Farmers and ranchers need that certainty. We've seen prices below break even for a lot of crops. Uh, so with ranking member uh, or with Bozeman moving into the, the chairman role, uh, Klobuchar likely moving into the ranking member role, uh, I think there's an opportunity uh, to get a farm bill over the finish line yet with Senator Stabenow before we start the next Congress. Um, help us understand a little bit about Klobuchar. To me, John, she strikes me as someone that is very much willing 
to sit at the table and negotiate. Is that the right read? Well, I certainly think so. And, and you you think about Minnesota agriculture in general. I mean, you, you had Chairman yeah. Peterson out of Minnesota. Uh, he was willing to sit at the table and negotiate. I don't know yep. how many farm bills he was able to get uh, over the finish line. So I think there's some some uh, you know willingness to work together. There's a lot of ag in Minnesota. Everyone knows that. So, uh, you know, if they're, if they're unable to get a farm bill over the finish line, I'm, I'm very confident in Senator Bozeman and Senator Klobuchar being able to work together uh, and get a get a five year farm bill for rural America. OK, so the timing of the farm bill then, John, does this push it into 2025? Uh, not not yet. Uh, you know, I still think there's an opportunity okay. uh, when they come back to, to get something over the finish line. Uh, you know, the uh, if you look at the 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 WASD, the ERS cost of production estimates, corn corn is 14 percent below break even soybeans, 8 percent below break even. Wheat nearly 30% below break even, cotton over 40% below break even. Margins are tight, prices are below break even. So there is a sense of urgency that we need to get a farm bill uh, over the finish line. We need to get a disaster package over the finish line to help folks that okay. were dealing with these hurricanes, dealing with, with drought. So there's a lot on the plate in the ag space that needs to get done. Uh, and, and quite frankly, be better to get it done now because when we get into the next Congress, we've got tax issues on the horizon to deal with. Okay. All right. So you went to the Farm Act on me there, John. It it sounds like you you with with all those uh break evens that you just listed, you've established that the Farm Act and some financial aid out there is necessary. Uh, can Congress get that done? Well, I think, you know, when I was on the committee, we were able to get emergency assistance for the rice producers. And Senator Bozeman, like and like I said earlier, who's incoming chairman of the Ag Committee, has signaled a need for assistance. I don't know what that will look like. I don't know if it will take uh, the shape of the Farm Act or if it'll uh, look like something different. Uh, I think the, the, the important element of all of this is, is probably the need to get bipartisan support on what a, a package uh, may look like for farmers and ranchers. Okay. Okay, so what I'm hearing is 100 bucks an acre on corn, 80 bucks an acre on wheat, 50 bucks an acre on soybeans in the Farm Act. Is that in line with what you are hearing? I think that's in line with the, the numbers that that I've seen floating around uh, on, on the hill here. Uh, but at the end of the day, Chip, you know, staff for the ag committees have to get in the room. They're going to weigh in the appropriators are going to need to get in the room and they're going to weigh in. It could look a lot different than what's been circulating. Uh, obviously, cost is, is going to be a factor. You know, what's the appetite yeah. uh, for spending? Uh, thinking about the disaster package that needs to move to. And then the farm bill plays into this 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 uh, conversation. Can we get a farm bill done? Because that's important. That gives farmers and ranchers the five years of certainty uh, that they need across rural America. So all of this is is related, Chip. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. John, now I'm going to ask you to sit tight. We, we, <laughs> because I want to bring Matt into the conversation. Um, big day, Matt, Fed day, quarter point interest rate cut expected. Is, is that in line with your expectations? It is, Chip. And I think your last speaker, uh, Bob, just nailed it too. If, if you're the Fed, obviously – there's some uncertainty. I will just say it lightly like that. Yeah. But you have to remain data dependent. And if you look at their data, they would be showing you that inflation is generally accelerating a little bit slower. It's getting closer to their 2% target. There's some cracks in the, the labor market. And they're looking to support it. And I think a quarter point cut seems very reasonable based on, on the data and the Fed's current view. Man, oh man, I tell you what, the jobs data that we got a uh, uh, last Friday, that was that was the first time, Matt, that I really got on board with the idea that, okay, maybe we do need to see an interest rate cut. And then when you look at the revisions to the to the September and and the and even the August jobs data, there's is there there's more than a crack in the labor market now, isn't there? Yes. Uh, we need to remember, though, that last jobs report had some two big caveats. Uh, we had two hurricanes in Florida. 
on top of some labor strikes, whether it was Boeing or, or some other smaller ones as well. So it, I, I'm very hesitant to take that jobs report and say that's really reflective, okay. Okay. if, if yep. you will. Yep. But yeah, yep. to, to your point, there's some accommodation needed. I yeah. I would say, though, if I'm thinking big term for, for your farmers, yeah. the the biggest thing that I'm following isn't necessarily what the Fed does right now, but what they're expect, expected to do over the next, we'll say, 12 to 16 months. Sure. And if you if you wind back the clock maybe 60 days ago, the market expected the Fed to cut, 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 you know, all the way down to even below 3% Fed funds rate at, at one point. Over the last, oh, I would say 60-ish days, where we've started to get some of this better economic news, whether that was uh, sales reports, retail sales, GDP, et cetera, the markets really slowed the amount of cuts that they expect the Fed to make. That doesn't mean that they won't be accommodative in the next several months or six months, so to speak, but maybe they don't get all the way down to 3%. Maybe it's more 3.5%. So for, for those of the farmers out there that have variable interest rates, Maybe that's not quite as low as they were expecting just a little while ago. So I, I think that's really what I'm focusing on. Not necessarily this one cut, but really the path and the expected path over the next 12 well, months. Yeah, Matt, uh, the pattern here. And and it is something that I'll admit is leaves me a little confused because, okay, I've, I've been an observer of the interest rate markets, not an analyst of the interest rate markets, but I take a, I, I keep a close eye on them. And I've been doing it for 35 years, and I don't remember a time when there's been a divergence between what the Fed is doing and what is happening in the real markets with with Treasury mm -hmm. yields. Um, I, I I still struggle to explain that. Sure, and and there there again, you've got um, markets that act a little bit differently. So your your short term rates very dependent on the Fed like a three month treasury, for example, or, or your variable interest rates for our farmers. Then you've got the longer term treasuries, which are reacting to a renewed sentiment that, hey, economically things are, are really okay. And maybe the bad vibes that we had four or five months ago were overstated, but long term growth still looks okay. Yeah. We've, we've still got a bit of a spending problem. If uh, oh, I'll say that one lightly, <laughs> we still got a bit of a spending problem <laughs> at a national level. So we need to price in a little bogey there for for maybe some um, funding yeah. issues long term. Yeah. Okay. As a result, you've seen the maybe we'll just say ten year Treasury. It's probably gone up oh about seventy to eighty basis points since the Fed cut rates in September. Yeah. So reacting a little bit differently, and so you've got a a steep yield curve, if you will, back yeah. to or a steepening yield curve. Maybe somewhat back to where we've been in the past pre um, pre pandemic. Right, right. Okay, all right, John. I'm going to come back to you real quick here. I've only got about 40 seconds left. What's Absolutely. more important in your in your thoughts, farm bill or clarity on 45Z? Oh, now now you hit me with with a tough one. I thought we were only <laughs> doing easy questions, Chip. Um, yeah, you know, I think. Uh, I mean, both are both are very important, right? I mean, uh, 45Z gives that clarity for for farmers out there seeking to grow a product for the sustainable aviation fuel market. You know, all of our friends out in Farm Credit Service of America country are looking at that. But the Farm Bill is also very important. That's a five year contract with farmers, Chip. We need to get that done. You guys are the best. Good stuff, you guys. John, thank you for answering the phone, buddy. Thank you. Anytime. You bet, Matt. Good to talk with you. I look forward to doing that again. John Newton, Matt Clark from Terrain. AgriTalk is brought to you by Neogen. Prioritizing herd health and embracing genomic testing are key steps toward maximizing your operation's success. Stay ahead of the curve, invest in your herd's health, and uncover their full potential. Learn more at Neogen.com. Welcome back to AgriTalk, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'm your pal, Davis Michelson, Chip Flory, here as well. How you doing, buddy? 
You're gonna uh, good. At the start good. of the show. You see you why gonna... I was trying to stay calm and conserve energy at the start of the show? I feel like you've done a really great job. You know, well, thank you. We thank almost you. we almost that. skewed into the rhubarb with that whole outbreak <laughs> thing, but we won't <laughs> reopen that. No. <laughs> While we've got a quick second here, I wanted to bring up a okay. couple of news stories that uh, that we didn't get to in the first segment here. Um, let's begin here. Through the first 10 months of this year, China imported 89.94 million metric tons of soybeans. That's up 11.2% from the same period last year. Just 10.37 million metric tons shy of the record in 2020. Chinese buyers expected to rush to import beans before Donald Trump takes office in January. Chip, is that a yeah. fair statement? You think? Um, I, I, it, okay. If, if China really needed the beans and needed the beans mm-hmm. in a big way, I mean, we keep talking about everything that they are doing to stimulate economic activity in China. Yeah. And part of that is import of raw commodities, put the people to work, generate wages and generate manufacturing product. Going, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I don't care if we're talking about soybeans or cotton, uh whatever the case might be, mm-hmm. they the the raw commodities I I would assume are needed in China. Now, if they've got a problem though, it, then I would I would assume it, that the demand would back off. So there's lots of questions that we need yeah. to answer there. But right now I want to bring in Jordan Fife, president of trading at BioUrgent. Jordan, hey man, how you doing? Joe, can you hear me? Yeah, hey, this is Chip. Jordan, <laughs> Chip, Chip, Joe. Yeah. Sorry guys, I've had I've had technical difficulties all morning. I had a telehealth call with my phone this morning and had the same exact issue, and I should have. I should have figured that out before I tried to call in. I'm sorry, guys. Hey. I apologize. No, no worries. No worries. No worries. Okay, let's jump right to it. What are your thoughts of the energy markets under a Trump administration? So that's a great question. And I think the, the best way to, to start this off is just kind of go back and and just look at what happened under the last three administrations. And I'm going to uh, uh, specifically talk a little bit about ethanol and crush margins here. So under the Obama Excellent. administration, if you look at it, the average crush margin for an ethanol plant, just the board crush, we're taking 2.8 bushels per gallon. Uh, we're not taking into effect uh, any of the stuff for corn oil. We're not taking into any of the other stuff. Just a simple board crush margin just to compare apples to apples. Uh, okay. Under Obama, it was at 48 cents. Under Trump, it was at negative two cents. I did remove 2020 because of COVID. It gets much worse, unfortunately, under that. And then under the Biden administration, it was 48 or 42 cents. So if you just go back and look at the past, you could draw the conclusion that Trump was not friendly for ethanol. I'm not making that uh, I'm not making that a, a, just a clear line in the sand. It's just those are the numbers. Um, okay. Specifically, what led to that under Trump? Uh, it was putting what I like to call a, uh, a fox in the hen house. Carl Icahn basically undercut the RFS. Um, yep. Trump put him in charge and 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 him and Wheeler and Scott Pruitt under the EPA uh, handed out small refinery exemptions, a ton of them. Um, and that slashed RIN prices, renewable identification numbers, down to the single digits, the lowest they'd basically been since the inception of the renewable fuel standard. What has changed since then? And this is, I think, where there's good news. If you listen to what I just said, you think I'm really pessimistic or really anti-Trump, and that's not just the case. But what has changed? The biggest change that I think we can look at is the involvement in big oil in the renewable space. That has changed dramatically since 2016. Those same people, whether it's P66, Valero, Marathon, whomever, those same people benefited from those small refinery exemptions under the previous Trump administration. Under the new Trump administration, all of those said players have renewable diesel, and they need those tax credits in order to make these very expensive investments in renewable diesel profitable. So I think with the consolidation and the new entry, you'll see a change there. And in fact, RIN prices are up since Trump has won. And it's kind of counterintuitive to a lot of what a lot of people have been thinking. Um, so I've been pouring over the numbers literally over the past day and a half, uh, and I'm kind of coming up with that conclusion. Don't look at the old numbers. Look at what's changed. Um, and I think that there is a, a good path under consolidation with big oil now in the space that things aren't going to get too sloppy. 
That is unbelievable, Jordan. Unbelievable analysis. Uh, um, so when I was talking with the, the folks at RFA and the folks at Growth Energy leading up to the election, they both felt that there was a path for renewable product under a Trump administration. You're telling me it's because of where where big oil is already invested. That's why there's a path for renewables under a Trump administration, right? That's right. That's right. Again, you know, if, yeah. if, if let's say he put Icon back in charge, and I don't think he will or whatever, but Icon could not muster it up. Again, the, the, they would be going against their own interests. And uh, the, the big oil companies have consolidated. They've uh, they, they've got a lot of lobbying power. Not to say that ethanol does not. You know, the folks at Growth and everything like that, they do a fantastic yeah. job. Um, but again, big oil is big oil. They're, they've, they've been around for 100 years. You know, renewables is kind of a, a new kid on the block. Um, so I would look at that. And, and then I've kind of come up with a little bit of a policy uh, a table, if you will, uh, and, and look at like RFS volumes. Uh, 15 million, or excuse me, billion is the number uh, for uh, conventional corn ethanol. I really don't know if they'll touch that. I don't understand why they would. I think that uh, uh, the one thing I would keep a close eye on is CO2 sequestration. That one might get modified, but there's a lot up in the air right now, and it's just too hard to draw any conclusions. But if there's one thing that Trump could reduce, I would think it's that. Uh, I think they probably leave most of it, uh, the, the rest alone. Jordan, let's stay in touch on this, man. I need more of this. I need a lot more of this. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. I'm sorry again, was delayed. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. No worries, man. Jordan Fife, president of Trading at BioUrge. Holy smokes. That was top level, top level analysis right there on what uh, we should be thinking about in the the biofuels markets. Wow. Whew. What a show. What a show. What a show. What a show. Thank you to everyone for coming on. Thank you for listening. We're going back to the top shelf for analysis this afternoon. Scott Varlick, KKV Trading. We're talking cattle here on Agritalk.